What's up, nerds? <laughs> Thanks for coming to my Ched Talk. I have here a note to myself, pause for an uproar of laughter and whimsy. I conferred with several of my colleagues, my esteemed colleagues, whether or not I should start my sermon like that. And they all said, Ched, don't do it. But I think that we can all agree together that I made the right call. That the, that the rhetorically effective sermon introduction achievement has been unlocked. We're now moving out of the beta phase. The sermon has successfully launched. So with that in mind, if you would turn in your Bibles to John chapter 18. We are continuing our ser sermon series on the book of John and we've come to chapter 18. We're gonna be working through the whole chapter, but I'm gonna start by reading verse 33 through 38. So let me read this, then I'll pray, and then we'll get started. Therefore, Pilate entered again into the headquarters and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here this morning to gather, to read your word and to sing your praises. I pray that you would be honored uh, by our time here, by your spirit. Uh, you would open our hearts to hear uh, the words that you have for us. We do love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. What is truth? Pilate's question is one that echoes through the ages. Poets and philosophers, tweeters and TikTokers have made their mark trying to answer this burning question. What is truth? There are many ways that we might grapple with this question about truth. In John's gospel, the criterion for an adequate answer to this question moves in a different direction. Here we find that the issue of truth is wrapped up with whether or not something accords with God's words. John contends that in the beginning was the word and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. One of the central theological developments in John's gospel, John's narrative, is the revelation that beholding his glory is directly related to hearing his words. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, wonder upon wonders. He also spoke among us. In light of the fact that in Jesus Christ, we hear the words of God the Son, the drama of discipleship in John's gospel becomes, what will you do with his words. Yes, Pilate's question is appropriate because the critical controversy of the hour was the reliability of the testimony that had been given about the identity and activity of Jesus. They needed an eyewitness to bear testimony. Do you know this man? Have you seen what he has done? Have you heard what he has said? As we look at the arrest and the trial of John in chapter 18, I want us to focus on what Jesus says, but also on what Jesus does not say. Two of the major themes in this chapter, uh, this chapter are the speech and the silence of the Son. This passage in John 18 is sometimes neglected, and you can kind of see why. It occurs in the middle of some of the most well-known passages in the, all the gospel. Chapters 13 through 17, on the one hand, is the longest sustained discourse by Jesus in the entire narrative of John. After gathering in the room with his disciples, Jesus washes their feet and instructs them in the way of humility and service. This is one of the richest places in all of scripture because here we see the son himself speak of his relationship with the father and the spirit. Jesus then also addresses the father on our behalf 
on behalf of the disciples and those who will believe on the basis of their message. In addition to this rich revelation, this lengthy section of discourse almost overwhelms the reader, overwhelms the reader with words, words about the Father, words about the Spirit, words about the glory of God that the Son receives, glory that was rightfully His before the world began. Words about trials and tribulations, words about peace and comfort, words upon words upon words. A key theme of chapters 13 through 17 then is that Jesus speaks so many words. By contrast, a central feature of John 18 is that Jesus speaks so few words. Whereas in the farewell discourse, it displays the speech of the Son before his disciples, the scenes that immediately follow showcase the silence of his, the son in front of his accusers. At key points in the trial, John will note that Jesus refused to give an answer. As a sheep before its shears is silent, <clears throat> so he did not open his mouth. On the other side of our passage, chapters 19 through 20 describe in dramatic fashion the crucifixion, death, and burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Chapter 18 then functions as a kind of interlude between these two pillars in the structure of John's story. In the flow of the discourse in the latter part of John's gospel, the arrest and trial scenes in chapter 18 are like the deep breath before Jesus screams, it is finished in John's dramatic narration of the Lamb of God slain for the sins of the world on the cross according to the scriptures. Chapter 18 includes the trial of Jesus, and this is fitting because one of the major focal points of this section is about the contested meaning of who he is, what he has done, and what he has said. John's purpose in writing is historical, but more profoundly hermeneutical. In these scenes, people are grappling with the accuracy and interpretation of the words that Jesus has spoken. As a reader, as readers of John's narrative, in the previous section, we have just also encountered a long series of words. We as the readers are drawn into the same interpretive dynamic. What will we do with these words? So with these features of the narrative in mind, let's follow along as Jesus is arrested and put on trial. Verse uh, one of chapter 18. After Jesus had said these things, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden. And he and his disciples went into it. Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas took a company of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees and came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. As I mentioned before, these verses... Uh, form a transition from the lengthy discourse of chapters 14 through 16, and specifically Jesus' prayer to the Father. The setting also shifts from the, place, <clears throat> from the place where they were having the Last Supper to the garden just outside of Jerusalem. After the growing tension that builds throughout Jesus' ministry, this is the moment that sets into motion the process that will lead to his death. The last major actions in the narrative have actually occurred all the way back in chapter 13. This 13, one through three. There John notes that before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them even to the end. Now when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. There in the upper room, Jesus got down and washed the feet of the disciples. In this garden now, Jesus stands up and faces his accusers. At this point, do you hear echoes of another garden scene? In the beginning, there was a garden where the man and the woman heard the words of the Lord and then encountered the words of the serpent who asked, has God really said? In our passage, Jesus is in the garden meeting with his closest companions and Judas slithers in along with the brood of vipers who will put Jesus on trial and ask, has the son really said? 
The disciples will here shortly flee before this day of judgment. But here we see Jesus as the new Adam take his stand where the first Adam had stumbled. Note also that this was a known location. This wasn't a secret hideout, but a place where the mystery of redemption was going to be revealed. So Judas leads the soldiers, officials, and religious leaders to the place that he himself had been before. By narrating these details, John makes clear that Jesus is not captured by force, but is voluntarily giving himself up. One of the things that Jesus says repeatedly earlier in his ministry is that his hour has not yet come. One of the effects of this phrase in John's narrative is to highlight Jesus' power. The Jewish leaders have already sought to kill him, and they have already sought to trap him in his words. However, the time had not yet come, so he avoided the crowds, or he miraculously escaped. But this time it's different. No one can take his life from him, but as the good shepherd, he's laying it down on his own accord. What might, what might appear to be an ambush turns out to be the beginning of the final phase of the mission of the son. Jesus knew what time it was. He knew his father's plan. He knew the pain and glory that awaited him. His hour has come. In verse four, John notes that Jesus, knowing everything that was about to happen to him, went out and said to them, who is it that you are seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they answered, I am he, Jesus told them. Judas, who betrayed them, was also standing with them. When Jesus told them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, who is it that you are seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. I told you, I am he. Jesus replied, so if you're looking for me, <clears throat> then let these men go. This was to fulfill the words that he had said. I have not lost one of those who you have given me. Notice here the repetition of Jesus' words. He asked them twice to identify their purpose. They are seeking Jesus of Nazareth. He responds both times in the affirmative. John also recounts Jesus' response again in his summary. So three times we hear Jesus' simple and direct affirmation. I am, I am, I am. One of the theological patterns in John's gospel is the showcasing of the times that Jesus says these words, I am. If you've read this story, you've heard him say, I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the door of the sheep, the resurrection and the life, the good shepherd, the way, the truth, and the life, the vine that unites us to the Father and the Spirit. Before Abraham was, Jesus roars, I am. He is the God of the living and not the dead. The book of John here with this pattern echoes the book of Moses. In Exodus chapter three, Moses hears the voice of the Lord from the burning bush. God had heard the cries of the people and will rescue them from the oppression of Egypt. Moses then asks them a question about the identity of Yahweh. He wonders, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, well, what is his name? What shall I tell them? God replies to Moses by declaring, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God unpacks this further with Moses by explain, explaining that Yahweh is the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. God is declaring here that he is the God who has the power and authority to define himself. If Israel is going to understand who Yahweh is, they need to look backward and forward. They can look backward. He's the one who made covenant promises to Abraham. He's the God who keeps his promises. He keeps his word. They can also look forward. He's the one who will rescue them from Egypt. He is mighty to save the God of creation is also the God of the covenants. The God of promise is also the God of power. The covenant name of Yahweh is not to be taken lightly. With the book of Moses ringing in our ears, 
we can hear Jesus' words buzzing with intertextual electricity. Jesus is claiming the divine identity as his own. He is the great I am. And when he says I am in this instance, everyone around him steps back and falls to the ground. It's as, it's as if Jesus' words have dropped like a bomb, slicing through the darkness like a lightning bolt. Make no mistake about it, Jesus has the power and authority to bring armies to their knees with only a word. In the speech of the Son, the God of glory thunders. But here, rather than hide their face like Moses did, they get back off the ground, they tie him up and arrest him. With thick, dramatic irony, Jesus is bound by those who just involuntarily bowed before him. So he is led to his trial on the path from the Mount of Olives, like Isaac walking up the path of Mount Moriah, like a lamb being led to the slaughter. Notice also that Jesus insists that his disciples not be arrested along with him. This was his burden to bear. This request also forced the focus to stay on him and his words. John comments in verse nine, this was to fulfill the words that Jesus said to his, in his prayer to the Father, I have not lost one of those whom you have given me. Now John is very careful in his use of this fulfillment formula. In fact, in the following chapter, John will stop his narrative and hit the pause button at very strategic points in the crucifixion and say, this took place to fulfill the scriptures. This took place to fulfill the scriptures. This took place to fulfill the scriptures. So by applying these, this fulfillment formula to Jesus' own words, John is making the remarkable association between the words of the scriptures and the words of the Son. At this point in the narrative, the action continues in verse 10 with Peter's zealous reaction. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. At that point, Jesus said to Peter, put your sword away. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? I think we can agree that this is probably the most striking point of this narrative. Yeah. Uh, years later, Malchus is probably perhaps vacationing in Laodicea, and he hears someone reading from the book of Revelation where it says, he who has an ear, let him hear. Malchus is like, very funny, John. <laughs> very funny. Luke's gospel actually includes that Jesus miraculously healed the servant's ear right there. But John omits this. But he also takes care to name the two people involved, Peter and Malchus. This selection of details prepares us for a later scene and also highlights the nature of Jesus' response. Peter was ready to fight, but Jesus has not finished teaching his disciples about the surprising and subversive nature of the kingdom. When Jesus tells Peter to put his sword away, he's also showing that the group of soldiers' formidable weapons are not really appropriate either. As he will later tell Pilate, his kingdom is not of this world and not secured by physical force. Jesus had come for the redemption of his people and his path included the cross. He will drink the cup that the Father has given him. After these exchanges in verse 12, the arrest is finally made. Verse 12, then the company of the soldiers, the commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus and tied him up. First, they led him to Annas since he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas who was the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be better for one man to die for the people. As John sets the scene for the trial of Jesus, we see here that the process is deeply embedded within the Jewish leadership. This is the culmination of a long and simmering conflict. John reminds us something that Caiaphas had said in chapter 11. After Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, the chief priests and Pharisees were worried that many would not believe in Jesus or that they would believe in Jesus and create conflict with Rome. They then began, they then began their plot to kill him. Caiaphas replied that one man dying would be better than a broader conflict. Here he spoke, he spoke better than he knew. 
as John noted there, Caiaphas' words proved prophetic, but not in the way that he meant. Jesus' death would not alleviate a political struggle, but in Jesus' own words, it would unite the scattered children of God. Throughout the trial before the Jewish authorities, the narrator switches back and forth between Jesus being questioned on the inside and Peter among those who are on the edges of the scene. Mark's gospel had established this back and forth structure. It's sometimes called a Mark and sandwich, <clears throat> where he begins a scene, switches to another scene, and then switches back to finish the story. This is a dramatic way to draw the scenes together and allow them to mutually interpret one another. John maintains this technique of quick shifts in the trial account. He says, I'll see your Mark and sandwich and I'll raise you a Johannine hamburger. <laughs> Just savor it. By doing this, John is able to zoom in on key details that echo other parts of his narrative, but he's also able to keep Peter's story in view alongside of the courtroom proceedings. We're actually to understand as readers that these things are happening simultaneously. Verse 15 begins this dynamic. John notes that Simon Peter was following Jesus as was another disciple. That disciple was an acquaintance of the high priest. So he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter remained outside the door. So the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the girl who was the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the servant who was the doorkeeper said to, people, said, said to Peter, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? I am not, he said. Now the servants and the officials had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. They were standing there warming themselves. And Peter was standing with them, warming himself. It's at this point that we see the theological payoff of this literary framing. Jesus is in the courtyard being questioned by the Jewish leaders. And at this same moment, Peter is facing an informal inquisition of his own. Notice too the direct contrast between Jesus's affirmation and Peter's denial. When asked who he was, Jesus replied truly three times, I am, I am, I am. When asked who he was, Peter responds falsely, I am not, I am not, I am not. As Jesus faces cold and callous questions in the courtyard, Peter warms himself by a charcoal fire as he begins to burn with betrayal. In verse 19, this perspective shifts back to Jesus. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. I have spoken openly with the world, Jesus answered him. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews gather, and I haven't spoken anything in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who heard what I told them. Look, they know what I said. Fittingly, when the perspective shifts back to the trial scene, Jesus is questioned about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus has proclaimed his message about the kingdom openly. His disciples have learned from his teaching. A good disciple is one who knows the voice of his master and can articulate the meaning of his message. Jesus has spoken so many words, and now the time is coming that his disciples will be the ones who will carry out the mission and the power of the Spirit. Those who have heard the words of Jesus can testify about this message. Because of the paralleled scenes, we hear Jesus point to the testimony of his disciples at the same moment of Peter's first denial. At this point of the trial, one of the officials takes offense to Jesus' response and slaps Jesus to correct and shame him. Whereas Peter had struck one of the high priest's servants, now one of those same officials strike Jesus. Is this the way that you answer the high priest, he demands? Jesus' response now turns to the truthfulness of what he has said here and throughout his ministry. His words were not in error, but this trial and these accusations are the ones that are false. After this exchange, Jesus is taken to the chambers of the Jewish council that will officially condemn him and transfer him to the Roman officials. At this point, John omits several of the details from the other gospels, but he's able to shift back to Peter one last time in verse 25. Now Peter, who was standing warming himself, they said to him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? 
He denied it, saying, I am not one of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said to him, didn't I see you with him in the garden? Peter again denied it, and immediately a rooster crowed. In this quick scene, Peter repeats the denial, I am not, for a second and third time. This time, the accusation is more specific. There's no way to weasel out of this one. John's gospel stresses so often the importance of eyewitness testimony. And here, an eyewitness identifies Peter as a disciple of Jesus at the scene of Peter's assault of Malchus. Peter's final denial and the sign of the rooster crowing are further examples of Jesus' words being fulfilled. Both ancient prophecies and recent predictions are coming true in the final moments of Jesus' life. In Mark's gospel, further details of the Jewish trial are given John has chosen to move directly to the final phase of the trial where he will give an extended account of Jesus before the Roman officials. The legal proceedings resume in verse 28 as Pilate is briefed by the Jewish leaders. Verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They did not enter the headquarters themselves. Otherwise, they would have been defiled and unable able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, what charge do you bring up against this man? They answered him and said, if this man weren't a criminal, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. Pilate told him, you take him and judge him according to your law. It's not legal for us to put anyone to death, they declared. They said this so that Jesus's words might be fulfilled, indicating what kind of death he was going to die. Judas had handed over Jesus to the Jewish authorities, and now they are handing Jesus over to the Roman authorities. The Jewish leadership asked Pilate to accept their verdict on Jesus without question and carry out the death penalty. After after convicting Jesus on trumped up charges in a kangaroo court, the Jewish leaders now insist on the legality of their injustice. The discussion with Peter, or the discussion with Pilate, involves a series of dramatic ironies that the reader is going to note as the story unfolds. This is how John shows the unfolding of his comment that he made in the prologue, that Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him. These Jewish leaders refused to enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be refused the Passover meal. They sought to observe the Passover ceremony while not observing that Jesus was fulfilling this ritual as the Passover lamb who would take away the sins of the people. They sought to pronounce judgment on the one who is the judge of the living and the dead. They appealed to Roman law, but they failed to realize that Jesus was in the process of fulfilling the law, the prophets, and the writings. John takes care to notice that this, to note that this failure also fulfills Jesus' words his, of his own prophecy, that he would be handed over to be crucified. In chapter 12, Jesus had said, as for me, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Pilate now engages Jesus on his own about the nature of these charges. Notice that we're here back to the question of Jesus' identity, the truth of his words, and the testimony that has been spoken about him. In verse 33, John recounts that, then Pilate went back into the headquarters, summoned Jesus, and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you asking this on your own? Or have others told you about me? I'm not a Jew, am I? Pilate replied. Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. You are a king then, Pilate asked. You say that I am a king, Jesus replied. I was born for this, and I have come into the world for this to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What is truth, said Pilate. In a remarkable way, Jesus draws the strands, the many strands of his teaching into a densely focused declaration about the meaning and purpose of his incarnation. The final outcome here in Jerusalem is not an inexplicable tragedy because he came into the world as the messianic king of the Jews in order to secure a salvation for anyone who would believe and hear his voice and believe in the truth of this message. 
Jesus knows what time it is. His hour had come. What follows here and in the beginning of chapter 19 is the verdict and the sentencing. In the actions and declarations of this final deliberation, the dramatic irony of this debacle only deepens. Jesus is found not guilty, but is nevertheless given the death sentence. They falsely declared Jesus a criminal despite his innocence, but then they falsely declared Barabbas innocent despite his guilt. They argued for the release of Barabbas, whose name means son of a father, while they sought to crucify Jesus, the true son of the true father. Jesus' closest disciples deny his identity and abandon him, while the Roman leader who finds no guilt in him and advocates him for him washes his hands of him. Pilate declares that Jesus is the king of the Jews, but makes a mockery of his authority. He asked, what is truth? But he neglected to see the one who is truth, the one standing in front of him. John began his narrative by by declaring, the word became flesh. And Pilate here declares, behold, the man. The Jews had said that they have no king but Caesar, but Pilate here declares, behold, your king. Notice that even after the verdict is rendered and being carried out, the Jewish leaders are still at war with Jesus' words. Pilate wrote, King of the Jews, in three languages, so that everyone who looked at this crucified one would see it. The chief priest asked that a caveat be added. Don't write, King of the Jews, but only that he said, I am the King of the Jews. But it was too late. The verdict had already been rendered. The Son of Man had been lifted up. The world now had to decide what to make of this crucified Christ. Was he a lying snake or the lamb who was slain? And now I've come to the end of my assigned text. As I prepared for today, and crafted my wickedly funny jokes. I wondered what application could I make here? What point of application could bear the weight of these words? One way of response involves noting that the, tri- the theme, the trial in John's gospel is not only an isolated account. It's actually one of the central themes that is load-bearing in the structure of the broader narrative. We also need to note, along with the Jewish leaders, that Jesus is no longer on trial. He was sentenced and crucified. The Son of Man was lifted up. He breathed his last, and then he was brought down and laid in a tomb and descended to the dead. He died. But three days later, the grave gave way, and when the sun rose, the sun rose. With his resurrection, death died. No, Jesus is no longer on trial. But you are. When John finally articulates his purpose in writing his whole gospel, he says at the end of chapter 20 that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Jesus is no longer on trial, but his words linger in the literary courtroom of this narrative. The Son of God is no longer in the dock, but even to this day, readers of this gospel are. Part of John's compositional strategy is to draw us in and force us to watch and weigh these words. The word became flesh and spoke among us. Signs have been given. Evidence has been examined. A series of witnesses have given testimony for and against Jesus. Now you too have been called into account. Do you know this man? Have you seen what he has done? What will you do with his words? If you can hear these words, then you are actually already convicted. The sentence has already been laid down. Are you confident? 
Are you, do you feel secure? Do you harbor hidden sin? Have you rejected the requirements of the kingdom? Are you relying on your own goodness and your own wisdom? Hear John's, Jesus say in John 3 that anyone who believes in the Son is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Hear him say that the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. These are heavy words. But the good news of the gospel is that these aren't his only words. Do you see Peter there warming himself by a charcoal fire outside the courtroom that night before the crucifixion? Hear him forsake his master and deny his discipleship? I am done with you, Jesus. You see Peter there warming himself by a charcoal fire beside the sea that morning after the resurrection? See him realize that the risen Christ has a word for him? Hear him say, to, hear Jesus say, do you love me? I am not done with you, Peter. If this can be true for Peter and John, then this can be true for you and me. If you can hear these words then the resurrected Christ has a word for you. If your heart still beats, if your lungs still draw breath, hear him say today, I am not done with you. Have you been wounded by this world? Hear him say that in this broken world, you will have trouble, but let your broken, weary heart beat again. I have overcome the world. Have you felt the sting of pain and the devastation of injustice? Have you reached the end of your ability to endure? Hear him say to your broken body and your weary soul, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me will live even though he dies. John's apostolic plea to you is this. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you can join this great cloud of witnesses and can testify with your own words. Behold, the Lamb of God who has taken away my sin and given me life. The believer in the Lord Jesus Christ can say, I have seen the way that the world ends. At the close of the New Testament in the book of Revelation, we see the Apostle John record another courtroom decision, the final eschatological verdict on the trial that began in John 18. In Revelation 12, we hear a voice from above declare the last word from the final court of appeals. The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come because the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown down. They conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. The textual witness of the scriptures and the work of God the Spirit in our lives enable us to join the ones who confess at the end of John's gospel. This is the disciple who testifies about these things and wrote them down, and we know that his testimony is true. He was bound so that you might go free. He accepted the penalty of death to secure your pardon. He rose so that by union with him, you might have life in his name even today. The Father has spoken to us through the Son and by the Spirit in the Scriptures. What will you do with his words? Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here to read your words, to sing your praises. I pray that by your Spirit, you would enable us to hear, to read, and to heed your words. We do love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.
Elder dismissed.